In 1971, a gruesome killer known for dumping his victims on the side of the freeway haunted the streets of Washington, D.C. Inside the coat pocket of one of his victims was a note which read, I will admit to the others when you catch me if you can. Freeway Phantom. The author of this note left six girls dead and has mystified authorities for decades, but there are still some clues and hints as to who the culprit may be. Carol Denise Spinks. On April 25th, 1971, a 13-year-old girl named Carol Denise Spinks lived in the Congress Heights in DC and was sent to the local 7-Eleven by her older sister Valerie to pick up some TV dinners and, as a reward, could get herself a can of soda too. During her trip, she was spotted by her mother, Alan Teen, who was not impressed that her sister had sent her to the store by herself. She told her to pick up the errands and get back home, but she never did. It was only a short distance between the 7-Eleven and her home, but something happened on the short walk that has baffled investigators ever since. When her family realized she was missing, they went to the police. However, this was 1971, long before the days of Amber Alerts, and when a child went missing, there was no immediate investigation. It was left until 24 hours had passed, and it was assumed that Carol would eventually make her way home. Nightfall came and went, and there was still no sign of her. A day went by, followed by another. Six days later, they would find out what happened. On a beautiful April day, some children were playing near a grassy embankment by the I-295 highway. They spotted something suspicious, and to their shock and horror, found the missing body of Carol Denise Spinks. Information from the police report made this event all the more heartbreaking. Carol was repeatedly sexually assaulted and was kept alive for several days before she was eventually strangled to death. Every parent's worst nightmare had just come true for this poor family. The only evidence from her body was green synthetic fibers, which may have come from a sweater or rug owned by the killer. There were also some African-American hairs that were not her own, and this leads us to our first clue. The killer may have been a black man. Romaine Jenkins, a retired DC homicide detective who worked on the case, said, In my opinion, the forensics on it show he was a black male. He was in his early to mid-twenties. Former agent Walter McLaughlin claims that the killer was likely to be a black male who was familiar with the streets where he operated. She was wearing the exact same clothes she had worn when she went missing, bar her blue tennis shoes. Furthermore, there were no marks to indicate that she was tied up or duct taped, which suggests that she was kept in a place where her screams could not be heard and there was little chance of her escaping. Jim Trainum, a retired homicide detective for DC's Metropolitan Police Department, said in 2019, based on the medical examiner, she was alive for a lot of that time because somebody fed her during that time period. In fact, she was given food by the killer to keep her alive. There are two important witnesses in this case, Cecilia Diggs and Deborah Harrison. Deborah was a friend of Carol's, and Cecilia saw Deborah and Carol together. While these two school friends were together, Cecilia saw two black men jump from a blue car and abduct Carol. Deborah was interviewed by police days later, but denied watching her friend getting abducted. Deborah also received threatening phone calls the next day. Deborah worried that she would be next. Darlenia Denise Johnson. Carol Spinks's murder was devastating for her family, and there was a huge outpour of sympathy across Congress Heights. Their pain was unimaginable, but soon would be shared by the Johnson family, who also lived in the same neighborhood. In July of that year, 16-year-old Darlenia Denise Johnson managed to get a summer job at Oxon Hill Recreation Center. While going to work, she told her parents there was an overnight sleepover at the center, so she would not be home that night. She left at around 10.30 a.m., and they did not expect to see her until the next day. However, there was no sleepover at the rec center, but like many 16-year-olds, she told her parents a tall tale to cover up what she was really up to. She was really staying at her boyfriend's that night. The recreation center was not expecting to see her at work again until the following morning, but she did not show up. The police showed up at the boyfriend's friend's house, but he did not see her that evening either. She bizarrely disappeared in broad daylight. Four days later, an employee for the Department of Highways and Traffic pulled off on the side of the I-295, and when he got out of his car, he noticed a fully clothed black female lying across the grass. And when he got closer, it became clear that this person was no longer alive. He called the police immediately. However, this was the second call the police received that day about the body. The police drove along the road and could not see Darlenia. But the most shocking aspect of this case is that the police didn't even bother to get out of the car to have a closer look. A week went by, and one of the callers went back 
back to where the body was discovered and was disgusted to find it still there. He then told his boss, who told his friend Charles Baden, a DC police sergeant, and the body was finally taken off the freeway. The lack of effort made by the police to find Darlinia's body struck a chord. It jeopardized the case and led many to believe that the police may have been more proactive had the victim not been black. The police had actually received multiple calls about the sighting of this body and has been resistant to responding, which is one of the earlier signs that racism played a role in the low quality police work done on this case. Because of this delay, an autopsy was not able to conclude whether or not she had been sexually assaulted because of the decomposition. They were still able to conclude that the cause of death was strangulation though. Darlinia's body was found on the same grassy embankment next to the I-295 and roughly 15 feet from the exact spot where Carol was dumped. She was wearing the exact same clothes she was wearing when she disappeared. The killer clearly wanted to make a connection between these two murders. African-American head hairs were found on her body, which helped make this connection too. She was only wearing one of her brown loafers, a minor detail that will become important later on in this video. Two apparent witnesses who may have spotted her. One saw her with a man who she thought could have been her boyfriend. Another claimed to have seen her with an older black man getting into a black car, but they did not have any proper leads to pursue the case even further. Sadly, the killer would strike again, but with each attempt made by the murderer, Murderer, more clues would come to the fore. This time around, there was a phone call. Brenda Faye Crockett. Carol and Darlinia lived on the same side of the city, so warning spread throughout the area that a killer was on the loose. To ensure he wasn't caught, the killer made his way over to the other side of the city. The first two occurred in the southeast, but the next attempt would be made across town in the northeast. Brenda Faye Crockett was just 10 years old and was known to be a bright student and loved attending church with her family. Like Carol Spinks, she would run errands for her family and in July of that year, she was sent down to the grocery store to get some bread and some dog food. And like Carol Spinks, she never came home. Her younger sister Bertha saw a panic in her parents' eyes as they started searching for her everywhere. Even at that young age, Bertha says, I knew something was wrong. With her parents out looking for her, the house phone rang and Bertha answered it. On the other line was her sister, Brenda. She told Bertha that a white man had picked her up and she was now in Virginia. The fact that the abductor was a white guy was a strange turn of events. African-American hairs had been found on the victims up to this point, all of which suggested that the perpetrator was African-American. A half hour later, Brenda called the house phone again. By now the kids, Bertha was being looked after by a family friend named Theodore Caldwell. Theodore answered the phone and this would cast doubts on whether she was in Virginia. Theodore told Brenda on the phone, tell him to come to the phone and tell me where you're at and I'll come get you. Brenda said, did my mother see me? And the boyfriend replied, how could she see you when you're in Virginia? Tell the man to get to the phone. The boyfriend then heard footsteps on the ground and Brenda said, I'll see you. The tone of her voice was oddly calm and she did not hang up the phone. It was disconnected. Hours later, her body was found by a hitchhiker on Route 50 near I-295 in Prince George's. It was not discreetly buried and the killer wanted her body to be found. A scarf was tied around her head and knotted. The time space between the phone call and the discovery of the body proved that Brenda was not in Virginia. What's more, synthetic fibers were found on her body, as were some African-American hairs. The white person in the story was all just a ploy to keep them off the scent, and Brenda was being forced into saying these things on the telephone. On this matter, Jenkins said, why would you let her call home not once, but twice? He had to make sure that the mother didn't see her. Police have gathered that the freeway phantom was somebody who knew the family. The phantom would attempt to strike again, but in a way that helped keep the authorities off his scent once again. Nenomoshia Yates as the weeks dragged on, there seemed to be a turning point in the murders. It was believed that this killer had somehow retired and things could go back to normal. But sadly, this was not the case. Nenomoshia Yates was a 12-year-old girl who lived near Benning Ridge, which is about a 20-minute drive northeast of Congress Heights. She had many friends in school and was known for her passion for rollerblading and biking. It was an exciting time for her as her stepmother had just given birth to a baby girl. She was still at the hospital, but the family was going to celebrate the arrival of her new sister. So her father sent her to the nearby Safeway store to pick up some paper plates, sugar, and flour. She would never get to meet her new sister. Ninomosia is believed to have gone missing on Benning Road at about 7 p.m. Her body was found a few hours later and was still warm. Her body was found in Prince George's County, Maryland. Some have argued that the body was deliberately placed outside of DC to protect the killer. By placing the body in a different jurisdiction, there was a separate police force involved in this case and complicated things. African-American hair and green synthetic fibers were found once again. A tire track was found nearby, which could have only come from a Volkswagen Beetle, but this was one of the most popular cars in the US at this time, so this did not give the police any interesting leads either. Next to her body was a brown loafer and Darlinia Johnson, 
was missing a brown loafer. Was the killer deliberately trying to link them together? Clearly the killer was leaving bits and pieces to mess with the authorities trying to find him. Her autopsy report does not make for pleasant reading. It revealed that she had been both raped and strangled. Much like the other poor girls who came before her, green synthetic fibers were found once again. Semen was found near her body, but this was not adequately preserved for when DNA testing became available. Had the freeway phantom been around today, this would have been crucial evidence. Yates' murder hit the news again. One little girl getting brutally murdered was one too many, but for four of them to happen, this was a truly numbing ordeal for the city. A now defunct tabloid newspaper called Daily News decided to describe the killer as the freeway phantom. For his next murder, we would actually get to hear from the killer himself as he finally broke his silence. Brenda Denise Woodward with the killing of Yates, the FBI decided to get involved. It was hard to figure out when and where he would strike next, but the city of DC was not a safe space for young black girls in this area. 18-year-old Brenda Denise Woodward had recently moved out of her parents' house to an apartment across the street, where she was staying with a friend. She regularly quarreled with her parents about her choice of boyfriends and also suffered from anxiety. During this time, people across the city were all well aware of the freeway phantom and that someone somewhere was preying upon young girls. When Nenemosia Yates disappeared, Brenda even called her her mother at work and told her to take care of her little sisters. Brenda had a job at the Parks and Recreation Department and took night classes too. One night, she was attending a night school at Cardoza High, and after her class, she and a friend got a bite to eat at a Ben's Chili Bowl on U Street. At 10.25 p.m., they both got on a bus heading northeast. Brenda had to get two buses home, whereas her friend only needed to catch one. On the second bus ride home, she was now on her own. After her night classes, Brenda would typically stop by her family's home before returning to her own place across the street. Strangely enough, she never turned up at her family's house that night. The next morning, Brenda's mother was on her way to a doctor's appointment. There were two things causing her distress while waiting at the bus stop. Primarily, she was incredibly concerned that her daughter had not come home that night. Secondly, the bus was severely delayed, and she worried she might be late for her appointment. Little did she know that these two concerns were linked. The bus was delayed because a body had been found on the side of the road. The freeway phantom had struck again, and the very person her daughter warned her about made her his next victim. Her body was found on the grass by an access ramp to Route 202 from the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. When her body was found, a note was inside her coat pocket. The police later found out that this was dictated to Brenda, so they did not have evidence of the killer's handwriting. The note read, This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit to the others when you catch me if you can. Freeway Phantom. Detective Jenkins claimed that the note written by Brenda did not have excess strain or force involved, which could indicate that she knew who the killer was. There were no signs that she was nervous when she wrote the note. You don't think calmly like that if someone has kidnapped and assaulted you. In a separate interview, Jenkins said she thinks the person may have been ex-military. When I showed the note to two separate people, one was from the FBI, and one was from Naval Investigations, and they both said, that note is military. The guy from the FBI said, I wrote orders like that. That is military. Her body was the only one found that contained defensive wounds. She tried to fight back, but was sadly unsuccessful. There were also two different hair samples found on her as well, one belonging to a Caucasian man, the other to an African-American man. There is still no confirmation of which belonged to the killer. Some say that the Caucasian hairs may have come from the towel that was wrapped around her body. It was the first direct contact with the freeway phantom. It told us two important pieces of information. He had a deep-seated hatred of women and was enjoying his notoriety. With these two pieces of information in mind, it was inevitable that he would strike again. Diane Denise Williams after the killing of Brenda Woodward, the killer took a brief hiatus. However, it would take another 11 months for him to make his next move. 17-year-old Diane Williams was traveling home and had just spent an evening with her boyfriend. She was told to come home every night before 10.30 p.m., but this time came and went, so her parents worried about where she was. It's reported that she was at a recreation center that night and was getting a bus home. The bus driver remembers seeing her and said that she had gotten off at her bus stop. She came across the phantom between the bus stop and the way home. Her father worked at Lawton Prison in Virginia as a correctional officer, and on his way home that night, he would have to pass by the I-295, the very freeway where his daughter had been dumped that night. It was as if the killer wanted him to find her, but it was not him 
We found her. The following morning, a tractor trailer stopped on the I-295 to check some of its equipment. Again, the person noticed something suspicious along the highway. And again, he saw the rather traumatizing image of a murdered young girl. When the body was looked at once again, the all too familiar green synthetic fibers reappeared. However, on this occasion, brown Caucasian hair was found on the body. It is speculated that the brown Caucasian hair is believed to have come from investigators. Again, semen was found on her body, and this time around, this evidence had been properly preserved, so it could be used for modern DNA testing. For the first time ever, the police could have had this killer's DNA on file, and it would be a major breakthrough. Unfortunately, the semen belonged to the boyfriend who she had been intimate with prior to meeting the Phantom. It seemed like at every turn, nothing was bringing the police closer to the killer. One of the most heartbreaking things about this case is how Diane's siblings found out. Their parents had been brought into the morgue to identify the body. They confirmed that it was her, but before they had a chance to tell the other children gently, Diane's siblings had already found out through a local news station, which broke the news immediately. Tiara Ann Bryant Although the Freeway Phantom is linked to the murder of six girls, the FBI temporarily linked this killer to the murder of Tiara Ann Bryant. On November 26, 1972, 18-year-old Tiara Ann Bryant had to visit Leland Memorial Hospital and had a minor medical problem. Her mother dropped her off at the hospital at 3 p.m. and was told to call her when she was ready to leave. She was also given a dollar for bus fare should she fail to get in contact. At 5.30 p.m., Tiara called home. Her brother answered and she told him that she did not need to be picked up and would get the bus home instead. However, she seemed to have different plans. At 6 p.m., she was spotted at Dunkin' Donuts, and then another witness saw her walking back towards her home. She decided to spend her bus money on some food instead and walk home. Ultimately, Tiara did not arrive home that night. Her mother called her boyfriend and all of her friends, but none of them knew about her current whereabouts. A day later, Tiara was found. Her body was floating along the shallow Anacostia River at a location roughly two miles from the hospital. One of her shoes was also found floating upstream. She was not found on the freeway like other victims, but there was an all too familiar form of killing. She was strangled to death. The county police ruled out that this was the freeway phantom on the basis that the killer tried to hide the body. John Hoxie, a spokesperson for Prince County Police said, you don't have the transporting and dumping aspect. This looks like the killer didn't want the body found. It was more conventional. Whoever the freeway phantom was, he was taking pride in his killings. And as his letter outlined, he also had a catch me if you can attitude. This killer was disposing of the evidence and keeping a close guard. Furthermore, synthetic green fibers were also not found either. But like all of the other cases, we still do not know who killed her and her family still has not received justice. If this was the freeway phantom, it was his last murder. He may have simply given the game up. He may also have been imprisoned, incarcerated, or moved away from the area. To this day, nobody knows conclusively who the freeway phantom is, but there are some key suspects, and I'll let you make up your mind on who you think this may be. The suspects. One of the most disturbing aspects of this case is that the killings may have been caused by two former cops, Edward Sullivan and Tommy Simmons. They spent less than a year on the police force and did not pass their probationary period because their guns apparently went missing. They saw a young woman named Angela Barnes and at gunpoint forced her into their car. She is also said to have been forced to perform a sex act on at least one of the men. She eventually struggled and Edward Sullivan shot her in the head. Sullivan's wife Dorothy found blood, fiber and hair inside the car and secretly reported her husband to the police and testified against him. In 1974, they were both brought up on murder charges and sentenced to jail. DC is a relatively small city and they were both in Wharton Prison, the very same institution where Diane Williams' father worked. Detectives told Victoria Hester, who co-authored a book about the Freeway Phantom, that they took steps to ensure that they were never near him while they were at work. They were both convicted of the murder of 14-year-old Angela Barnes. Angela was an African-American minor who perfectly matched the victim profile of the Freeway Phantom because her body was discovered covered close to an abandoned road. She was shot as opposed to the other six victims who were all strangled. So in this case, this homicide's method of execution was very different from the previous crimes. Ultimately, there has never been conclusive proof to link these two men to the freeway phantom. This has led to conspiracies that the police may have covered up to protect themselves. At the time of these crimes, there was also a serial rapist gang known as the Green Vega Rapists. A green Chevrolet Vega car was the scene of all of these crimes. There was a certain arrogance in using the same vehicle for these crimes. Usually, when a crime as despicable as this is perpetrated, the criminal works by themselves and keeps this sordid activity to themselves. In this case, they found a group of like-minded individuals who all shared the same evil passion. Five different men were involved in this gang. Apparently, there was one specific gang member who drove the vehicle. He was a five foot nine African-American man who was both stocky and bearded. He was aged between 25 and 30. 
When convicted for various rapes and abductions, gang member Morris Warren confessed that the gang was involved in the murder of Brenda Woodward, but he was not a reliable source and his account of information did not stack up with what the police knew. It was also argued that he was lying to the police to help with his prison sentence. Gang member Melvin Gray was another member who did the same thing. He said the gang was involved in the murder of Carol Spinks, and he gave even more incorrect information than Warren, and it was clear that he was lying too. But there is one suspect that many believe is the most credible, the main suspect. Kim Rosmo, a former Canadian police officer and a professor at Texas State University, developed a computer system that could find out the killer's anchor point, which could be a home or workplace in the area. A geographical anchor point was St. Elizabeth's Hospital, a mental asylum in Washington, D.C. The hospital was just across the way from the embankment where the first two bodies were found. Whoever was doing these crimes was not mentally well, and there's been speculation that the killer could be a patient from this facility. On the other hand, it could be a doctor or a worker at the hospital too. But there is one person that was in this building that fits the bill for the freeway phantom, a patient named Robert Askins. Askins was a convicted kidnapper within the area. He was charged with homicide three times and spent time as a patient at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Lane Pardot and Victoria Hester, a father and daughter who authored a book about the freeway phantom and did an extensive amount of research on this killer, think that this guy is the most likely suspect. Robert Askins spent time here in St. Elizabeth's. Um, he what had a problem with women that went back to the 1930s. He tried to kill women and successfully killed women. On December 28, 1938, Askins was just 19 years old and went to a local brothel. He decided to hand out cyanide-laced whiskey to five sex workers, leading to the death of sex worker Ruth McDonald. Two days later, he stabbed another woman at the brothel named Elizabeth Johnson. Like the freeway phantom, he had a ferocious hatred for women, one which he had no problem sharing with the world. He was declared criminally insane, and when he was released in 1952, he killed another woman, Laura Cook. What's more, he strangled her to death, just like the freeway phantom. Although this is not enough evidence to convict someone in a court of law, both Askins and the freeway phantom were known to regularly use the word tantamount, which is a somewhat obscure word that not many of us would use in everyday conversation. Askins worked at the National Science Foundation as a computer technician and was known to use this word regularly. Blaine Pardot and Victoria Hester named their book about the Freeway Phantom tantamount as a nod to how much of a clue this simple word could be. Askins denied any involvement, stating that he did not have the depravity of mind required to commit any of the crimes. He died in prison in 2010, and perhaps his deepest and darkest secret is something he took to his grave. Aftermath when all was said and done, the city of Washington, D.C. would never be the same. The killer had ended the lives of many young girls and devastated their wider friends and family circles, but there was an even deeper impact. Parents, particularly those of young girls, would be wary about leaving them out on their own. A lot of the victims were simply becoming adults by doing errands for their parents, taking night classes, seeing boyfriends, doing various things that made them more independent and helped them grow into adults. All of these small liberties we take for granted were taken away. Most of these girls were running errands for their parents, innocently playing outside, innocently walking to the store, and they're just gone. As I mentioned earlier, there were accusations of racism against the police force for its lack of urgency. The statistics from this time suggest that there was a disconnect between the police and the general public. According to the Washington Post, more than 70% of the district's 757,000 residents were black, and there was widespread distrust of the police department, which was more than 60% white. When news got out that the killers may have been ex-police officers, the trust between the police and the public reached an all-time low. You need to understand that at this time, the atmosphere was incredibly tense. Three years earlier, Martin Luther King Jr., the leader of the civil rights movement, had been shot dead. His assassination escalated into deadly riots across Chinatown, Logan Circle, and parts of Capitol Hill. It lasted for four days, and 13,000 troops were needed to calm things down, and was the most military scene in the city since the Civil War. But regardless of its truthfulness, saying that the police force was racist is a far too simplistic explanation of why the killer was never found. This was also during the heat of the Vietnam War, and angry protesters flocked toward DC to send a message to the political establishment. The FBI was called in, but then the Watergate scandal took place, and they decided to divert their attention to that too. According to Jenkins, If you wanted to be a criminal, this was the time to do it, because all the police were pretty much tied up. That being said, what could be more important to me than protecting innocent children? That was unusual, Jenkins recalls, because murder, as far as we are concerned, took precedence. Additionally, the city was simply not used to having a serial killer. 
This was the first time we had ever had anything like this. So we were totally, totally unprepared. While watching this video, you might have wondered why I've included the middle names of all of these victims. If you can recall, three of these victims had the middle name Denise, and the authorities were so clueless on how to find the killer that they thought this might be a pattern. Warnings were even sent out to parents of children with a middle name Denise. The police were completely and utterly out of their depth. The mystery remains unsolved, but many families have still not given up hope. Finding out who did this will not bring their family members back, but it will provide them with a sense of closure perhaps justice. He kept textbooks from one of the girls. He kept hair curlers from another girl. He kept shoelaces from another girl. Some family member may stumble across those things and say, why did he keep this junk? We may never know who the killer was, but we do know the victims. These were young girls with their entire lives ahead of them and people we should remember. Thank you so much for watching. Please click the videos you see in front of you now for more and I will see you there.